this chapter um, that's titled Forced Migration and Attitudes Towards Domestic Violence, I, uh, I explore this, uh, the effects of forced migration in the case of Turkey on uh, women's attitudes towards domestic violence. And let me start by giving a more general motivation. Uh, so by now we have a large body of evidence showing that civil war and conflict uh, can have long-run consequences on uh, various economic outcomes and human capital accumulation. Um, but we have relatively little evidence on the long-term effects of uh, forced migration, which affects millions of people uh, in the world today. So the most recent official data I could find was from UNHCR uh, going back to 2015, and even then there were 60 million official uh, ref uh, displaced people and slightly more than half of them were actually internally displaced people, which we have even less evidence from. Uh, so of course, now that those numbers are much bigger, uh, yet we know little about the long-run effects of, uh, of uh, forced migration on, uh, on economic outcomes. Also, we, we have very little evidence on effects on cultural norms and attitudes. So the question that I try to explore in this chapter is, uh, can conflict-induced uh, forced migration um, have effects on gender norms, norms in the long run? Uh, and if so, through what mechanisms could these effects uh, take place? So um, I explore this in the case of the uh, forced migration that resulted from the conflict between the Turkish state and the Kurdish uh, militia in the uh, mid 1980s uh, until the end of the 90s. Uh, and during this period, uh, of course, the type of forced migration that might result from uh, a conflict can vary from different contexts. So I think it's important to pin down exactly what type of migration uh, I'm studying here. Uh, so the type of migration was mainly from rural to urban areas and targeted towards uh, the Kurdish population. So during this period, and I will give much more detail about the context in a few slides, uh, the main uh, impact was that Kurdish villages were destroyed uh, for various reasons and uh, according to official figures around a million people were uh, displaced and it mainly from going from rural to urban uh, centers. So to study the effects of this on, uh, on attitudes towards domestic violence, I use uh, uh, two, two data sources, and the main one is uh, using two waves of the Turkish demographic and health survey. Uh, and I use the two most recent waves. There are four waves. I used 2008 and 2013. And the reason I use these waves is because uh, there I have detailed information on uh, three dimensions that are key to my uh, identification strategy, uh, which is based on a triple difference in difference along these, uh, these dimensions. So the first one is ethnicity. Uh, and that I, I use the information on the mother tongue of the respondents and the main uh, d uh, groups are Kurdish versus Turkish in the sample. Uh, the, second one, uh, the second and third one are based on this migration module which wasn't done in the other waves of the DHS but uh, in these last two waves there is a detailed module about the migration history which records both the place of origin, the birthplace and also the place of childhood until age 12 and then every, uh, every movement for, for any uh, location where uh, the respondents uh, spend at least six months. So that enables me to identify the time and the direction of the movement, uh, which is important for the uh, identification uh, strategy that I use um, in, the, in the analysis. I also uh, have a unique data set <coughs> that I use more for supportive evidence due to various limitations that I'll come back to. Uh, and this data, uh, I acquired it from a, an NGO, one of the largest NGOs in, in the country that, uh, that aims at uh, helping women that suffer from uh, domestic violence. And uh, due to uh, anonymity reasons, I'm not going to name that, but it's a, it's a large NGO and uh, the data covers essentially the universe of applications that they received from 2009 and 2011. So of course this has a very, lots of limitations, that's why uh, I'm only going to m claim that it's some supportive evidence, but uh, I think it's also uh, important to, to, uh, to, to, to look at and uh, I'll, I'll come back to that later on. So of course the first question is why should forced migration affect uh, women's attitudes towards domestic violence? And um, 
I think Roberto did a great job in summarizing the literature on, um, on intra-household bargaining, and one potential mechanism might be uh, related to that. Uh, and in a, in a standard cooperative bargaining model, uh, we would expect that uh, if for any reason migration improved women's outside option, then that should lead to a, a, a drop in the, in the rate of domestic violence and potentially in the long run also about expectations and acceptability of domestic violence by, uh, by both women and men, but I, in the data I only have women. That's why I keep referring to women's uh, attitudes towards it. Um, but on the other hand, we know uh, there's a growing body of literature, as Roberto summarized, that uh, non-cooperative bargaining models are, uh, seem to be, at least in the developing country settings, uh, more and more uh, relevant. And in fact, if we model domestic violence under such a uh, non-cooperative bargaining situation, it's not so clear that an increase in women's outside option uh, will necessarily lead to a reduction in domestic violence. And in fact, uh, literature outside of economics and sociology has for a long time written about the male backlash theory that if women's uh, uh, autonomy improves, this might create a backlash from the men uh, and that might result in more domestic violence. So theoretically, it's not clear which way the, uh, the effect might go, might go, but to the extent that if uh, forced migration have had an impact on women's um, outside option relative to men, then it is likely that it might have had an impact on uh, domestic violence and the attitudes about domestic violence. Um, so as I mentioned before, in the, going back to the Turkish context, uh, the, the main uh, movement was from forcing uh, populations to move from rural to urban centers. Uh, and in the, both in my data and in general in other uh, studies that have looked at uh, female and male labor force participation rates, uh, it seems that in Turkey, the, the style as facts is that in, in rural areas, uh, female la labor, par par labor force participation and employment rates are relatively higher compared to in urban areas, and especially this is the case for women with low schooling. Uh, on the other hand, for men, uh, we, we see a smaller uh, difference between the rural and urban, but if anything, the difference is the other way around. So in the urban areas, male labor force participation rates and employment rates are higher. Also, unemployment rates for women have been shown to be higher, again, in the urban sector, and especially for unskilled labor. So in that, in that sense, it is not unreasonable to expect that this forced migration uh, may have uh, reduced women's employment opportunities once they were forced to move to the urban centers. And most of them were uh, either had ne had don't have any formal schooling or have very little. And so they were definitely in the unskilled labor. So if, the, if we go by just the simple uh, rates of employment rates uh, in rural urban areas for low-skilled labor, it is likely that women's employment rates were lower. And in fact, I will test and show some evidence in line with that uh, in, in my data set as well. So in that sense, like the, it seems like uh, the bargaining power mechanism might be active and that could be one potential uh, channel. Another channel might be through um, cultural diffusion. So in Turkey, uh, if we again look at uh, the, 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 the data set, the, for example, the DHS data, we see that in urban areas on average, uh, respondents are less likely to find, say that domestic violence is acceptable compared to rural areas. So in some sense, in urban areas, uh, on average, there is more, we can say there's more progressive gender norms about domestic violence. So uh, in that sense, it, it, since this movement forced uh, women, uh, populations to go from villages to the urban centers, uh, it might have uh, led to a cultural diffusion whereby the migrants' norms eventually change in the long run and uh, might become also more uh, not accepting towards domestic violence. So this would go uh, in, the, in, a, in, a neg in a positive way, uh, making domestic violence less acceptable. So what I find in the data is that I find that uh, Kurdish women who, uh, who migrated during the conflict from uh, the conflict region, uh, who were from the conflict region and migrated during the conflict, they are uh, 10 to 15 years later when they are surveyed, they are significantly more likely to say that they, they think domestic violence is acceptable under at least one of the situations they are asked about. Uh, and uh, the magnitude of the effect is really large. So it's around 50% relative to the, uh, to the group I use as the counterfactual in the, 
uh, difference in difference analysis. So it's a, it's a big increase in, in, in their rate of finding, uh, reporting that do domestic violence is acceptable. Uh, and when I try to uh, look at the mechanisms, I find some evidence in line with the bargaining power mechanism. In particular, I find that forced migrant women using the same identification strategy, they are uh, more likely to be in a relationship where their spouse is working, but they are not working. So the, the gap in the employment rates between men and women in these households has increased. And this is, again, in the very long run. So I, unfortunately, I can't look at the immediate effect when, when the migration uh, took place, but I can only look at it at the time of the survey. And it seems like there is still some uh, significant uh, difference between uh, men and women's employment rates. Uh, and also, there, there's, there's more poverty still. So they are, on average, below the uh, mi middle class in terms of the wealth uh, score that DHS assigns to households. So both the poverty has increased and also the uh, uh, women's bargaining position relative to men seems to have uh, decreased. Um, when I use the second data set from the shelter NGO, so this data set uh, has, as I said, various limitations. And the main one is that it's, of course, a selected sample of women who decided <coughs> to apply to this, uh, to this shelter. Uh, so they decided to seek help for domestic violence. The advantage of the data is that it is, uh, first of all, reported by the applicant to the, uh, to the center. So in terms of the reporting bias that we typically expect to see in, the, uh, in domestic violence uh, cases, even in criminal records, like it's relatively reasonable to think that what they report there is quite truthful. And there's a relatively detailed information about the case, uh, the type of the violence, and the, extent, the duration uh, of the relationship in which they were uh, subjected to it. Um, and it, when I compare controlling for as many things as I have information on, the forced migrants to the, uh, to the rest of the applicants, I find that forced migrants have been in, a, in the relationship for a longer period before applying to the NGO. Uh, and they, they are also less likely to have uh, sought other types of help compared to the others. Uh, and they've also su seem to suffer more extensive violence. So on the intensive margin, uh, they have suffered for both for a longer period and also more severely before deciding to come to the organization. So that, again, as I said, is suggestive. There are various uh, shortcomings that we can discuss, but it's, it supports the idea that uh, the forced migration may have uh, reduced uh, their likelihood to not uh, fi find domestic violence acceptable and to seek help uh, quickly. So overall, both findings are in line, uh, in line with that. So in terms of the related literature, um, the, first of all, it's related to a large and growing literature on the uh, interrelation between gen conflict, civil war and conflict, and, uh, and domestic violence. And uh, here there is little but growing uh, uh, literature that tries to estimate these effects. Um, I think in particular, uh, one paper by Julia Lamatina that was recently published in the Journal of Development Economics is quite closely related. And there, she looks at the effects of the Rwandan genocide, uh, the long run effects on, in terms of domestic violence rates. And she finds uh, similar evidence. But there, the mechanism is very different. She uh, looks at the, the, the big effect on the uh, sex ratios in the population and finds that uh, where, the, where women's uh, sex ratios have fallen down, the domestic violence rates have increased more, which seems to suggest that the, the bargaining power through the marriage market uh, is more relevant. So in, in the case of in, that I'm studying, the effect, the direct effect on uh, sex ratios is likely to be not so, so large. The number of deaths was nowhere as large as in the case of Rwanda. Uh, but other, uh, the bargaining power effect might again be there through uh, the employment mechanism that I just described. And uh, then it's also uh, related to a, a larger uh, literature that looks at the interconnection between women's bargaining power and domestic violence. So on the empirical side, as Roberto also mentioned, uh, the evidence is, like if we look at it globally, it's mixed. But if we try to make a general conclusion, we can, I think, say fairly that in developed countries or high income settings, typically uh, 
uh, when uh, women's uh, outside option improves, domestic violence seems to go down, whereas in low-income countries, it's, uh, it's the other way around. So Turkey is, of course, kind of in the middle. Uh, and in that sense, I think uh, the, the two papers I mentioned here by Manuela Angelucci and uh, Boboni Setal from Mexico are probably, like, if we just go by rough GDP per capita rates, are the most comparable. And, uh, there they find, on average, that uh, an improvement in women's bargaining power, which uh, they are exploiting the conditional cash transfer program that was targeted to the women in the household, uh, on average goes, uh, is associated with a fall in domestic violence, but the effect is very heterogeneous and depending on uh, the size of the transfer, uh, Manuela Angelucci shows that it's, it might be uh, the other way around if the transfer is very large. But on average, it's in line with uh, the, 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 thing, the results I'm finding also in the Turkish case. Of course, I'm not looking at the rate of domestic violence, but uh, if we can think that the two are correlated, then uh, it's similar. Oh, sorry. Here's um, finally, I mean, I think it's also related to uh, a growing literature on the uh, connection between the effects of migration and cultural uh, diffusion of cultural norms. Uh, so there, of course, this is difficult to estimate the effects of, uh, of migration on the migrants' attitudes because migration is typically very selected and endogenously, se endogenously so. So migrants, uh, people who decide to migrate, presumably do so also taking into account the uh, existing cultural norms in the places they choose to go. Uh, but in the case of forced migration, I think this selection effect is less so, or if anything, it's, it's not there at all. Uh, so in that sense, uh, exploiting forced migration might be kind of a methodologically convenient way to also uh, estimate the effects of it in, on the migrants' attitudes. Okay, so for the rest, um, I'm going to first give you a bit more context about the, um, the, the migration that I'm studying here, and then talk about the data results, uh, so yeah, pretty standard. Okay, so in terms of the, the context, uh, so the conflict here was uh, mainly between the, the, the Turkish army and the state and the Kurdistan Workers' Party, or PKK. And it, uh, even though PKK was founded uh, before, in the end of, towards the end of the 70s, uh, the violence really escalated in mid-80s. Uh, and from 84 until 99, it continued at a very high intensity level. Uh, and then it kind of uh, died down at, with the capture of Öcalan, Abdullah Öcalan, the leader of PKK during that period. But then, as we know, recently it, it's uh, escalated again, but I'm not studying the recent wave. I'm looking at this uh, period. Um, and during this period, there were many villages that were either evacuated or destroyed. And uh, according to the official parliamentary uh, report from 98, uh, this report cites three main reasons. The order uh, that I listed them here is the order that's in the report, and it's, I'm not sure if that order is correlated with the relevance of that reason by any means. But the three reasons uh, mentioned in the report is one is the collapse of agriculture and animal husbandry, which are the main economic uh, sources of revenue income for the uh, livelihoods there. The second one is that uh, they're saying that uh, PKK was evicting villagers and destroying villages that were cooperating with the state. And the state was also evicting villages that were not cooperating with the state or with the, or cooperating with the PKK. So which one of these was the main driver? As I said, there's no official figure on that. And uh, so I, I don't want to make a judgment uh, personally, but all three of these effects were there. And in the end, uh, again, the official figure is there were uh, there was between 900,000 and 1.2 million people that were displaced because of that. Uh, and uh, again, recent uh, information shows that uh, even as recent as 2009, only 20% of them had returned back to their, um, back to their villages. Um, so in terms of the, the location, so, the, so this is the map of Turkey and these green uh, the provinces that are highlighted green are the uh, is the area where the the main the high intensity conflict was taking place. Although uh, there were also terrorist attacks and uh, other types of uh, maybe more minor conflicts in other parts, especially in the surrounding provinces. Uh, 
but these states were uh, really mo the, where the conflict was happening and the most of the migration was also taking place. They were also declared by the government to be under a state of emergency all throughout this 84-99 period, which gave the government uh, uh, more rights and so the evacuations were really taking place there. So. I'm going to compare essentially uh, people from this area and migrated from this area with people from the other uh, other provinces. So these other, the blue ones, uh, are the ones where, uh, again, according to the official report, most of the migrants went uh, and settled. Uh, but also in these area, uh, as I said, from the villages, uh, a lot of them settled in the town, in the province centers. So the data that I'm using um, is coming from the DHS. Um, and as I said, the, the main advantage of here is that uh, there was the migration module that enables me to do the uh, analysis that I'm conducting. Uh, the, the respondents were, for the last wave, all women aged 15 to 50. And uh, as many of you know, I'm sure the DHS surveys <coughs> the, that age group because of uh, the yeah, reproductive uh, modules, etc., are mainly targeted to that age group. And then uh, in the 2008 wave, it was only, uh, they only surveyed ever married women. I'm going to pull both, both data sources, uh, mainly because I need like a lot of uh, power to do the triple difference analysis, but uh, I, I control for, of course, survey wave uh, effects and, and also the marital status to make sure that the results are not driven by this uh, restriction. Um, and for the for my main outcome is the uh, I'm using this module on the uh, respondents' attitudes towards domestic violence, which exists in most uh, DHS uh, waves. Some DHS uh, DHSs also ask about direct incidents of domestic violence. Unfortunately, in Turkey, this was not uh, included, so I only have the attitudes uh, towards domestic violence. And here. Uh, there were seven different situations that the respondents were asked about <coughs> in 2008. And then in 2013, they limited that to the first uh, five. Uh, again, I'll, I'm going to use both, but the results are not really driven by the last two. So if I exclude those two and only focus on the five, uh, I find similar effects. And the, the, the situations, I mean, I don't think they are directly important, but it's things like if she burns the food, if she neglects the children, etc. But I use all of these things to build uh, indices uh, in three different ways. The first index will be whether the respondent thought that domestic violence was acceptable under any scenario. Uh, and the second will be the, num the fraction of scenarios. And the third will be a principal component. But I think uh, it's fair to say that the first index, that it shouldn't be accepted under any scenario, is probably the, more, the one that is most relevant. Uh, and finally, the ethnicity uh, is the, the third important uh, dimension that I look at. Um, so these are just some descriptive statistics from the entire sample. And then if I limit the sample to people that uh, grew up in, this, in these conflict provinces, uh, and you can see that the, the sample is, goes down a lot. And then if I also look at the ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, division within the sample, uh, in fr people from the conflict region, um, a larger share of them are Kurdish because that's where uh, the Kurdish population is mainly uh, based. Uh, and in the other regions, there are way fewer uh, Kurdish respondents. Um, and let me see. So in terms of the main outcome of interest, the do uh, on average, 20% of respondents reported that they think domestic violence is accepted until uh, un under one of at least one of these uh, situations and you can see that the rate is higher uh, for people uh, for respondents from the conflict region uh, and especially when we look at people that migrated during uh, it's even higher it's 38 percent of course that could be due to lots of things so it's important to control for uh, as many predetermined covariates as I can so I'm going to control for things like their parental education whether their parents were uh, related. The, so basically anything that I have that are uh, likely to be predetermined to the migration, I will uh, control for in the specification. And so the main specification that I estimate is, as I mentioned, is a triple difference and difference model. 
where I, um, uh, the differences come from the uh, ethnicity of the respondent, uh, whether she grew up in the conflict region, and then if the migration happened between uh, during this conflict uh, period. Now, of course, one caveat is that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a forced migration if it happened during the conflict period. So here, unfortunately, I don't have exact information on whether it's forced. It was not asked, uh, but it is. But I'm assuming that people that migrated during this period are more likely to be uh, forced. So in a way, you can think of it as like an intention to treat thing, but I, I don't have the means to uh, only focus on uh, forced migrations because I don't have information on that. I will control for respondents' age and age square, which was, uh, so it was significantly different between the uh, people that are migrating during this period versus not. So that's, again, uh, because the, I'm looking at the effects of, from a survey 10 years later, of course, people mi that moved during that period are older. <laughs> So I'm controlling for their age and age squared, their parents' education, etc. Um, right. So the, the parameter of interest will be the triple interaction between these three dimensions. So in in, in the paper, I, in, I I report all the controls, but here in the interest of you being able to view it, I only show you the triple interaction term. And you can see that, uh, so here in this column, the outcome variable is whether respondent thinks domestic violence is justified under any scenario. Uh, the point estimate is 16 percentage points. Uh, if we compare it to the mean in the full sample, it's a very large effect, so the mean was 20%. But perhaps the more relevant comparison group is uh, Kurdish women who did not migrate during this period but are from this area. So for, for that subsample, the average level of the outcome is 32%, which still means that this is a 50% higher likelihood that they uh, think, so Kurdish women who migrated during the period are 50% more likely to think that domestic violence is justified relative to Kurdish women who did not migrate during that period but are from the same area. Um, right, and then if I use like the other indices, fraction of scenarios that uh, she thinks domestic violence is justified, or the first principle component, the, the percentage effects are similar relative to the to the mean. So I do um, I try to do a, pl uh, a few types of placebo tests <coughs> in the paper. Uh, well, actually, this wasn't in the draft that I think was circulated, but it will be in the next round because these are more recent. So in particular, uh, I tried to uh, use the small sample that I had before of people that moved before the uh, forced migration and then compare uh, people that moved uh, before the conflict period uh, and people that moved way before the conflict period. So kind of a, a placebo test. And I, there I don't find any significant uh, effect. So that kind of is reassuring, I think, because it shows that the, the previous effect that I showed you is not driven by some pre-existing <coughs> trends uh, uh, that, that was already taking place, um, which is in line, so the, in a way it's supporting my uh, identifying assumption of parallel trends. When I, if I look at uh, the breakdown of the different scenarios, um, again, as I said before, I'm not sure exactly how to interpret them, but uh, it seems like the effect is mainly driven or is more precisely estimated for these three scenarios about neglecting children's needs, arguing with her husband, and refusing to have sex with him. The, for the other scenarios, the coefficients are positive, but usually imprecisely estimated. Well, they're all imprecisely estimated. Uh, but as I said, I mean, I think it's fair to say that all of them are positive, and for most of them, it's similar. Okay, I have 15 minutes. Now, in terms of the mechanisms, as I said before, uh, the, it is reasonable to expect that the migration may have reduced women's employment opportunities. So if I look in the overall sample at employment rates of women, I also see what previous literature from Turkey has shown, which is that uh, women in urban areas, their employment rate is uh, lower on average compared to in rural areas in Turkey. Uh, so in, in rural areas, <coughs> women's employment rate in my DHS sample is about 40%. In the urban areas, it's uh, 29%. 
And of course, if we break this down by schooling level, uh, it's very uh, it's interrelated. And uh, uh, women that have low schooling, their employment rates are way lower in the uh, urban area relative to the rural, whereas women that have high schooling, there's no significant difference. And then for men, even though the differences are smaller, uh, the, the reverse uh, relationship is there. So on average, men are uh, more likely to be employed in urban sector, but in the rural sector, they're less likely to be employed. So I'm not trying to say anything about why this is. It's beyond my uh, paper, although it's interesting. Uh, but it's, so it's reasonable to expect that this forced migration may have reversed the, uh, or, or affected the bargaining position uh, within the household. So for that, I look at uh, the likelihood that their husband is working when the respondent is not, and I see that there's a 11 percentage point uh, increase in this probability, even though this effect is 10 to 15 years after the migration. Uh, and it's a large effect relative to the sample mean. So that, again, is in line with uh, the, the bargaining power being affected. OK, now, uh, in the remaining time, let me also show you what I do with the data from the applicants to the women's shelter. So as I said, this is one of the largest NGOs in the country, and it is well known. Uh, and so it, even though I, I don't try to claim that this is the universe of women that seek help, it is a large share of them. Uh, and uh, I have around 3,000 applicants that uh, came uh, to the NGO to seek help between uh, these two and a half years. It's from mid-2009 until the end of 2012. And uh, I use this to test if forced migrants have uh, remained in an abusive relationship for longer and also have suffered like more intensive uh, domestic violence before uh, at the time of the application. So these are some summary statistics from this data set, uh, which is really uh, like not the most uplifting thing to show, unfortunately. But uh, so the type of information on domestic violence are things like, so I have one question about the duration, which is if uh, whether the uh, relationship in which domestic violence was experienced started more than 10 years ago, and also uh, whether the domestic violence started at the beginning of the relationship. So I, I combine these two things to define a variable, which is violence has been going on for 10 plus years. And 30% of the applicants said yes to that. And if I compare uh, forced migrants to other applicants, it's much higher amongst the forced migrants. And the way I identify for forced migrants here is different. Uh, there is no migration history, but there is a direct question, have you ever migrated? And then if yes, what was the reason? And one of the options is due to security reasons. And discussing the, the way the data was recorded with the NGO workers, uh, that, is, that means it was uh, forced. And so I, I define forced migrant based on that. Um, and then uh, other in outcomes is like whether she received any treatment, physical or um, psychological treatment, before coming to the center. Only 12% of the applicants said yes. Uh, whether she filed a legal complaint, very small, only 4% said so. And it was much, uh, it was lower, again, significantly lower amongst the forced migrants. Uh, if she complained to anyone, including friends, family, uh, or authorities, only 52% of the applicants said yes to uh, any of the uh, potential places. And again, the rate is lower among forced migrants. Uh, half of them were raped. And uh, again, the rate is much higher amongst the forced migrants. And finally, uh, there was one question about if she had a miscarriage due to domestic violence. 8% of the applicants said yes. Uh, and the rate was almost double uh, amongst forced migrants relative to other applicants. So in the analysis, I control for, uh, I regress these outcomes on being a forced migrant, controlling for being a migrant in general. Uh, I also control uh, in a, for additional things that I, I have information on, such as the timing of marriage, uh, whether the marriage was forced marriage, if it was a family, uh, Mar like mar marriage with a cousin or a family member, um, whether the respondent has an independent source of income. So even things that are potentially endogenous to forced migration, I control for to see if these are driving them. And it seems like with all of these, the, the correlations are robust to controlling for, uh, for these. So forced <laughs> migration seems to be positively correlated with the likelihood of uh, uh, having been in the relationship for more than 10 years. <coughs> 
before coming to the NGO, uh, le negatively correlated with receiving other treatment, uh, and negatively correlated with seeking other help, which is kind of important because, of course, it could be that maybe they didn't come to the same geo, but they went elsewhere. So that doesn't seem, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, there is no uh, significant, at least, correlation. If anything, it's negative between co going to the police or friends or family and uh, being a forced mind. Finally, when I look at um, if they were uh, forced to have sex uh, against their will or if they had a miscarriage, they are more likely to say uh, yes to those as well, the first one. So, yeah, the, and as I said, the, uh, it, the relationships are robust to controlling for the things I have information on. So, to conclude, it seems like the conflict induced uh, migration in, the, in this uh, context um, led to a uh, led to uh, an increase in the likelihood that women uh, think that domestic violence is acceptable. Uh, and this was a long-term effect 10 to 15 years later. And uh, one possible mechanism that I'm able to uh, kind of test for is uh, the bargaining power effect. And I find uh, evidence in line with, with this, that women's bargaining power, women's economic opportunities, and therefore their bargaining power was reduced relative to men because of the forced migration from rural to urban uh, areas in this context. Of course, this doesn't mean that it will, be, uh, the, it will work in the same way for all types of forced migration. It, it depends a lot on the context and uh, where they are forced to move from and to where. Uh, but in this context, this is, um, this is what happened. But overall, I think we can draw a general conclusion that uh, it is reasonable to expect that uh, forced migration might lead to effects on gender norms and uh, it might have bigger consequences in terms of women's well-being. Uh, so the effects might be uh, heterogeneous by gender and I think it's important to take this into account when designing and implementing policies on uh, forced migration. Thank you.